Another thing I was fascinated with was I want to first just ask about the world premiere we're seeing this week, uh, Emery LeCron's uh, new work. Could you talk a little bit about commissioning this work and how you came to know Emery's work? Um, well, being in New York, it's basically the dance nexus of the world, which is great. Um, and you keep on reading about different choreographers who come and are presenting work at various venues. And in fact, that's one of my goals is to see as much as I can in New York for dance. Um, but there's almost too much sometimes. And Emery's name had come on the radar um, a few times, and I'd seen her work at uh, Columbia Ballet Collaborative uh, in New York, and I was presented with a wonderful opportunity with some very nice friends of mine here to commission a work for the group. And uh, it was actually supposed to be made last year, and we basically ran out of time to make it. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, I know Ella said it in the beginning today, but I'm a pretty busy guy. So <laughs> finding time is a little difficult. Uh, so I decided I really wanted to find a, a couple and a cast that could invest themselves so deeply in the work that they could make it their own. Um, and so I think Emery was able to use the inspiration of this work from a year ago and then be able to draw on it. And uh, in fact, the dancers were so completely different. And so Emery was able to tap into that and then extend upon that and basically give it uh, a second life, if you will. Um, and so that was kind of neat because I think it actually has a bigger and better life than it was originally intended to. I mean, the thing that is fascinating about this program is seeing work by uh, people who are still dancing and making work. I mean, Tess, maybe you could talk a little bit about what it's like to uh, be in a work with somebody whom you also dance with. So you, you dance in uh, Justin's work, and, and just sometimes you know him from standing next to you in class, and then sometimes he's the choreographer. Could you talk about what that's like? Um, well, with Justin, it's special because he's a choreographer that comes from our company. Mm -hmm. So he knows everyone personally. He knows their dancing so intimately that um, it's very nice because he knows immediately everyone's strengths, their weaknesses, he knows what they look best doing. So he has a unique knowledge of the dancers of New York City Ballet and I think is able to uh, use that very well. So, so he's really able to, to push you to the things that he already knows you can do. Does he also help you find stuff that you're not so familiar with doing? Oh yes, I mean he definitely pushes all of us. Uh, with speed, uh, you can see that phrasing, in the, in the Dvorak and, especially. Right. He has a very specific musicality. Um, he he likes to get the scores and kind of like delve into them and um, and find notes that you wouldn't necessarily notice when just listening to the piece and kind of like make you notice them by adding movements in at, at not obvious times. Mm -hmm. I think. So you have to really understand how he's hearing the music mm -hmm. to dance it. Yes, but, which seems so different than. Tyler, from the work we see you in, and that beautiful, uh, the singing voice of, da of Don Landis is so it different. Great. Yeah, it's it's just so, it's such a different kind of atmosphere to hear the, the lyrics, to sort of the, the world we're in when you're maybe used to more uh, typically dancing to classical scores. Can you talk about that? That song actually is, in, is quite contrasting to the rest of the work in Two Hearts, even though the entire <clears throat> composition itself sprang from that song. It's a song that Nico Muley, the composer, uh, grew up with. He was heavily influenced by folk music when he was younger. And he played this song for Benjamin once, and then as Benjamin was like listening and humming over the first melody, and talking about a tree growing, literally talking about you know this rose being you know grown up, and then Nico just starts to do this sort of Rudy growing thing with his right hand on the piano, which is what the ballet starts with. And then the left hand came in. So the song, I wish you could hear the rest of it, the song springs out of it. So I, before I ask you more about Fancy Free, I just, we gotta talk about Larry Kegwin for a second and that fabulous sunshine. Um, lots of people who have seen Kegwin's work or remember Kegwin at the height of his dancing is that he made really impossible to do dances. And he has kind of done, done that for you, although you have such mastery over it. Can you talk about what it's like to work with a modern dance choreographer? Well, it's different. I mean, I think all of us have worked in a room here where the choreographer can still show a lot of it, whether mm -hmm. it's Justin or Benjamin mm -hmm. and with Larry. And, you know, sometimes it's a turnoff because they do, they do it so well. And you sit back and you go, well, I want to do that. And, and, and you're, you're really becoming the vessel for that, that voice of that choreographer. I picked this solo, and there was another solo I was really torn about bringing here um, to a Piazzolla tango that I really enjoy performing. And 
Uh, the other one I've danced many, many times, and this one I haven't danced as much. And so I think I approach it very differently because it's not, um, I don't know the places to breathe where I normally like to. I don't, it's not as predictable uh -huh. to perform. And I also think for myself as an artist, I want to showcase a slightly different side. I mean, there, there is a certain level of technique, of course, that's involved, but this is a different artistic side than what, I, what I'm normally seen on stage doing. And it's also, uh, as an artistic director, I, it seems like you're making a choice also about what we're hearing, because we're hearing Bill Withers after we've heard Don Landis, and to have those, this other set of uh, voices is a really nice uh, partner for you in that dance. Is the way I look Absolutely, at it. And, and that's the inspiration behind, I think, so, many, so much of the work that we're doing here. C can you talk about uh, the decision, like a fancy Free. It's a big, um, familiar work to lots of people, a fabulous masterpiece. You know it from dancing it together. W what about bringing it, uh, it's a, I mean, it's a, this is a lot more cumbersome than a, a, a solo. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, I, I want to thank the, the Pello crew for getting this up and running and off the truck <laughs> and on stage because this is not easy. Um, this is a heavy set. It takes a, you know, a tractor trailer to bring it from point A to point. It's a big toy. Um, <laughs> I had this a is also Daniel's baby. Like, if a part of it was falling, he would dive under it to break yeah. the fall, <laughs> for sure. As because, you should, it's beautiful. I mean, because you've, you've now had this built for, yes, for a year. for my group. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew I wanted to bring it on the road. And what's a, a challenge, when we talk about this a little bit further, um, there was something about the history of dance here at The Pillow. And when I was originally talking with Ella about designing a program, I mean, it, it's hard. One program can't sum it all up. Mm -hmm. And to really take... Uh, you know, in the first half of the program, none of the pieces are older than 15 years old, um, which is really interesting to kind of catalog through. Uh, and then completely flipping that on the other side, with Fancy Free being made in 1944, I think it really is a wonderful way to showcase um, not only the versatility of the dancers, but I'm also a big fan of getting more than one or two dancers on stage. So besides the dancing, which Tyler, you've talked about a little bit, it's also the sense of really particular character and, and, and that you have a story to tell, which is very different from kind of an evocative sense of something. Here, you really have to communicate the who's paying, who's paying the bar tab. You know what, all of those kinds of things. What's the head shift like for you to go from from um, sunshine into these characters? Um, I've probably danced this role for about ten years, on and off, and I don't think it was till about the seventh year I was comfortable in my character in this. Um, I did all the steps. It was it was taught to me, and it was accurate, and to really delve into it and to kind of take on that character. Uh, when this was originally taught to me, uh, along with uh, Ethan Tyler here, uh, I was in the room by myself with Jean-Pierre Froelich, who was the very first cast who performed it at New York City Ballet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was interesting. I was taught to, okay, look over here on the, fi the fifth count, whatever, of this phrase. And then he goes, well, what are you looking at? And I was like, well, no one. There's no one else in the room. It's just me. But to create what happened, and then when you add the dancers in, you automatically create the story that's supposed to happen. And it's really... I, it's actually a very interesting thing. It's a compliment to you all as an audience, but it's also a compliment to the pillow is the venue allows you to be so much more accessible to the piece. So it's very interesting. We're laughing as we get on stage and you know, going, oh, they got that joke today, or they read that, or that came across. I mean, to see Robbie's eyebrows at, at State Theater from the back of the house <laughs> is impossible. I mean, you know. Uh, but to see it up close here, it's very natural. And so I think this venue serves the piece quite well. Um, it's a little tight spatially for us, but we're pros. Uh, well, I have to say, I, w I was talking to uh, Norton Owen, who's the director of preservation. Um, you probably have had a chance maybe to look at the film from uh, 1949, the last time this piece was done here. And I think the stage was 12 feet shorter, so quit your crying. No. <laughs> I think the set was smaller. Though. Yeah, the set was smaller. The set was yeah. smaller. <laughs> uh, I, did my ho I did my homework on that one. But so, love the hat, hate the hat. Part of that characterization has to do with kind of the genius of what Robbins did, and that's in the first 30 seconds, uh, you should know each character. And so, by the way they walk, by the way that they uh, wear their hat, so, I mean, easily, mine comes down like this. I have a very short fuse as my character, so I'm like this. Um, Tyler wears his like this, and Robbie wears his like this, the suave guy. <laughs> and all that comes across in the way we walk. So mine is almost looking to pick a fight. This is his first time in New York, and Robbie has been there before. Yeah, and so all these nuances come out. So Tess, can you say something about what it's like to be, instead of a, a group of 80 at City Ballet, that you're, you're 10 people here, and just sort of what it's like to be a little more streamlined? Tess has also been on like five years, five, 
I don't know, a lot of these now, I feel. A lot of, yeah, yeah. way more than five, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we go way down. back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I enjoy them because we get to dance uh, more here than we would mm -hmm. in a typical evening at New York City Ballet. We get to dance different things. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of love it because, you know, rep that I've watched for years and years at City Ballet kind of just like drooling, like, oh my gosh, I wish I could do that. I get the opportunity, many opportunities, especially with Daniel, to, to perform things that I wouldn't otherwise get an opportunity to, or as kind of a, a preparation. You know, I, I had danced Diamonds Potida for Daniel Albrecht a number of times, and then uh, last year I got the opportunity to dance it for New York City Ballet, and it was just that much less daunting because I had had a few extra, you know, times under my belt, uh, you know, doing it on stage in, in smaller venues, but mm -hmm. still, um, I don't know, I think it's very much a blessing. I, I'm sort of imagining the old, hey, let's put on a show. Like, these are your friends. What, talk a little bit about putting the group together and deciding to take this on on your summer vacation. <laughs> Uh, lack, yeah, it's summer vacation. That's, that's in a couple weeks. Um, no, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world. You know, I have incredible artists who um, believe in what I'm doing. And to ask them to take that time, which could be vacation or something else, uh, they, they believe in, you know, bringing art out there. And uh, I always say this to people, you know, when you put together the show, it's not about just, you know, achieving the artistic end, which it is. But I, I don't just scrutinize the dancers artistically, but as people, you know? These are people who are ambassadors for their art forms, and isn't that the way it's supposed to be passed on? Mm -hmm.